Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's such a beautiful place for a meeting. And the, the topic that I want to talk about, Bill Fishes, uh, is of course related here to the location because you can find some of these species in the local waters. And because they're so unusual, I want to give you a bit uh, of background information before I actually get into the, uh, into the group hunting aspect specifically. Okay, let's make sure I use this right. So what these fish do is, um, <clears throat> certainly these sailfish, they hunt schooling fish, like these sardines you see in this picture. And there are about 50 sailfish in this picture going after them. And this is a typical scene during the early part of the hunt. And the sailfish will then peel off smaller schools of sardines, 100, 200 or so, and then go after them and in many cases um, kill all of them. Um, but the larger school will often return to the deep and it's those smaller subunits that uh, die. And when you look at group hunting in, in the literature, it's really uh, apparent that a lot of the work on group hunting has been done in organisms where individual recognition is very important, where the individuals perform different roles during the group hunt, where you often have a closed membership to groups. You might even call them teams in some cases. And you see spatially coordinated attacks. So this type of group hunting often requires um, complex cognitive abilities. And when you look at reviews of group hunting, they are mostly about these aspects. And what I want to discuss in this um, talk are alternatives, simple mechanisms that can be involved in group hunting and bring benefits to individuals um, when they hunt aggregated prey. So here's some pictures of the, uh, the billfishes. I'm sure everybody has seen uh, this one probably on your plate. Um, the swordfish, most people are familiar with it. It's actually surprising how little is known about these animals um, in the wild. None of these species can be kept in captivity and some of them live quite deep like the swordfish. So uh, sports fishermen capture them all the time. People eat them daily, but very, very little is actually known about um, <clears throat> their life history and uh, hunting strategies. And some of the even more obscure species are these uh, spearfishes here. Some of those are also here in the Mediterranean, this one over here. And the study that I will be talking about took place uh, near Cancun. So we went out into this region here between Cancun and Cuba, going far offshore. Um, looking for these fish. And when you find them, what you see is this. So this is in slow motion, 240 frames per second. It's a top-down view. The sailfish uh, arrives and interestingly swims at about the same speed as the prey, puts the bill very close to them, and then they get whacked. Um, so you see scales flying, a lot of tissue also in the water, so massive damage to these fish. <clears throat> yeah, and then the surprising thing is um, the sailfish does it again and, um, and again and again. And the fish don't really seem to learn all that much, at least from what we can see here in the process. So on this occasion, the sailfish was not um, successful, but it will return. There's nowhere to hide for these fish. I show you another one here. So here you can also see some potential handling with the bill. So often when they hit the fish, they will actually put the bill towards it and sort of guide it into the mouth. <clears throat> yeah, 
yeah, finding these fish is very hard, but once you've found them, observing them is actually not that difficult. They're not afraid of us. Um, we were initially afraid of them. They sometimes uh, come closer than you might expect, and, uh, but they never actually touched us. Yeah, one of the first things we did when we made these observations, we tried to define states and transition probabilities between states and construct uh, simple first order Markov chains to get an understanding of the uh, dynamic process. And I quickly take you through this. So um, they arrive at the fish school, they approach, they put the bill really close to the fish. And why the fish let them do that is something <laughs> we still find puzzling. Um, and then they either whack them really hard, a slash, or they tap a single fish very lightly, but this will destabilize the individual. Usually they make prey contact, sometimes there's prey handling, and then they either consume the fish and sometimes they also miss them, and then they return and try again. So reapproach, and then it continues. So here's some of the initial work we did with Paolo Dominici. <clears throat> And we looked at the speed and acceleration of the, uh, the head, the, uh, the snout, and uh, the tip of the bill. And this, the uh, tip of the bill reaches quite amazing accelerations during this um, slashing process. And the ca calculations from Paolo indicated that these accelerations are actually higher than those of the sardines than the escape behavior of the sardine. So once the bill is very close, it's actually very difficult for the sardine um, to escape. And in the analysis, we looked at fish, at sardines that are very close to the bill before they actually get hit. And what you might expect is that these fish, we call them here target fish, that they should increase their tailbeat frequency to get out of this zone where they might get hit. And we compared them to other fish that are outside this area that will be impacted by uh, the bill, and we found no difference in the tailbeat frequencies or no difference in the overtaking behavior, not during bill contact, but post-bill contact. Suddenly, these fish, after getting hit, they accelerate. So clearly they are capable of swimming faster than they initially do, but they don't re seem to realize that danger is imminent. And I, uh, I show you this in the video one more time. You see it quite nicely here at the beginning. So the sailfish comes and it puts the bill close here. And this would now be the moment to really get out of there. I mean, these fish shouldn't be here. And they could easily overtake the others. They can do it, but they just don't. And um, the question is why. So here you see then what happens. <clears throat> so one possibility is that um, the bill is so thin that it's simply below the looming threshold required for the fish to perform an evasive action. So normally when predators like sharks, dolphins, and so on come with their mouth and try to grab a fish, the fish will see this large object coming towards them, and this triggers this evasion response. And probably the bill is too thin. It's long enough so that the fish probably believe they are safe from the sailfish, um, and they don't take it as seriously. <clears throat> but we wanted to take a closer look at these bills to understand what the surface properties of them are. And um, this is here an image of, uh, taken by a micro CT of the bill tip. And as you can see, it's covered in lots of um, nasty micro teeth. And they cause this damage to the fish when they make contact. Interesting feature here is also that they're actually pointing forward away from the mouth of the sailfish and virtually all predators they're facing um, towards the mouth to retain the prey. Yeah, and then came a long and painful process of uh, obtaining this. 
And this is where my brother and um, his team did a lot of work. So I had initially <laughs> naively assumed that I would take my billfish head and give it to a scanning facility, that they scan it for me, and then that I, a week later I would have the data on the number of these teeth and, uh, and their properties, when it actually took us two years um, to get this. This is almost as bad as counting uh, wildebeest. Um, it's very tough, actually, um, to design an automated um, micro-teeth recognition software. So what you see here is a ring. We took out the inside from the bill, and we just take sort of one slice, if you like, take out the inside and just concentrate on the surface properties. And then we can uh, label these teeth in different colors. So if they are still complete, we make them here purple. And if they are broken, they become turquoise. And when they are broken, <clears throat> they will fall out, leaving these cavities. And then new teeth will regrow. So we went to the dental hospital and had this whole process explained to us. Um, I didn't really know anything about teeth before that. Yeah, and then we can look at tooth distributions along the rostrum. So this is close to the mouth. This is the bill tip. And we find that the percentage of broken teeth increases towards the front. You would expect this because that's where most of the uh, biomechanical forces are at play. Here the upper symbols are the marlin. Down here the sailfish. We see the same trends, but the marlin shows a lot more broken teeth, a higher percentage. Um, and this is probably explained because they have, by this here, they have very little um, regrowth. Whereas in the sailfish, we see they're regrowing a lot of teeth. And I'll come back to that later on when I show you um, the Markov chains comparing the uh, different attack behaviors. Another interesting aspect which um, Sitzel Bui investigated in our team was the presence of an oil gland that they have at the base of their bill, discovered by John Widdler a couple of years ago. We found similar structures filled with oil in the other species that we work on. You can see it here, oil-filled cavities. And uh, we looked at the composition, chemical composition of this oil. Looks like the swordfish down here disappeared. <clears throat> that was our uh, reference uh, specimen to reproduce John Widdler's data. But as you can see, the oil composition um, chemically is actually very similar between these um, species. And we didn't find anything exciting in this oil, by the way. It's just normal fish oil. I mean, I had high hopes of finding some interesting stuff, maybe for bill repair or other things. And the function that John Widdler proposed when he discovered this structure is that this oil is excreted dorsally onto the forehead of the swordfish and provides hydrodynamic benefits when they swim, because they are among the fastest swimmers in the oceans. So here you can see the, uh, the oil pores in different species. So they're actually sort of really perforated on the dorsal surface. Yeah, and an interesting finding here was that in the swordfish, this oil really just comes out on the forehead. But in a species like the sailfish, it seems to cover the entire bill. And the question is, of course, why? Um, because hydrodynamically, this wouldn't really make a big difference. We expect the highest friction um, to occur up here and not so much um, on the bill itself. And so what we are planning to do in the future with this system here, we want to um, uh, 3D print these builds and then have some with and without micro teeth with and with this oil and then look in flow chambers at the hydrodynamic properties of these objects and also the interaction with live fish to see um, whether there are actually properties um, that could hydrodynamically camouflage these um, builds, make them less noticeable um, to the fish um, during attack when the bill is inside the school. Another aspect which we investigated um, was the, uh, the function of the sail 
and only one of these species has a sail, the others don't, so this big dorsal fin. And it turns out that they always raise it just before they attack, and it prevents the head from swinging. So you can see here when it's down, then head and tail are in antiphase, and they can then minimize the swinging of the head when they put up the sail, and it comes at a tremendous hydrodynamic costs, they slow down, they need to compensate for that, but it seems to be very important for them to keep the bill really still when they put it into the fish school and then hit the fish with very great precision. And this is a work by Stefano Maras. Yeah, this probably might be a bit small for the people at the back. Um, we were wondering, I mean, why does only one species have this uh, massive uh, sail and, um, and it's absent in all, almost all the others? And we looked at the attack sequences in different species, comparing it to the marlins here, and it turns out that some of these other species that also hunt in groups, when they approach the fish school, they will actually speed up massively. So the tail beat frequency goes up and they plow through the fish school often divide it, and they do it with an open mouth and they try to, uh, to grab fish. And they don't actually make that much use of the bill for hitting the fish. Um, and this might also be why um, they don't really massively regrow teeth, micro teeth on the bill because they're not reusing uh, using the bill as much. Yeah, and an aspect of the speed, um, obviously, uh, the larger the, uh, the predators, um, the faster they can uh, swim, the bigger the stride length, and this can be very important in predator-prey interactions. The bigger fish or bigger animals are usually faster, and the smaller ones are more maneuverable. Um, and the sailfish were considered the uh, record breakers in the fish world. This went back here to estimates from the 1940s, and 1960s with estimates of over 100 kilometers per hour. This always sounded a bit dubious, to be honest. And uh, once we saw how the fish attack their prey and that they swim at about the same speed and that I can snorkel alongside them, we were wondering what do they actually need these high speeds for? <clears throat> but of course, there might be situations that we haven't seen where they go very fast, so it was really a matter of measuring it. And we took two approaches to this. One is a muscle twitch method, which gives you a theoretical maximum, and the other one is uh, that you put, attach accelerometers to these fish in the wild, let them hunt for a while, and then get your accelerometer back and uh, look at your values. This was largely done here by Morten uh, Svensson. So uh, we uh, looked at the stride length of the fish um, that can be attained in one tail bead, done with a high resolution sonar. Then you look at the muscle contractions and <clears throat> how that corresponds to tail beads, and then you can work out an estimate of the maximum swim speed without taking into account the drag underwater. And uh, you see the different species here. We captured all large predators that we could find in the pelagic waters there. The sailfish were the fastest among those that we tested, but you can see that these values don't even reach 40 kilometers per hour. So they were actually a lot slower than, uh, than we had expected. So uh, we removed this claim from uh, Wikipedia and elsewhere about these uh, 100 kilometers. It's actually very interesting when you look at the uh, original claims from the 1940s. The Russian article from 1960 was apparently never translated into English and I think a lot of people just trusted um, that it presented measurements, but it didn't. It actually just told the story and the 1940s article was published in Country and Life and I think it was never really meant to be a sort of serious scientific claim, but it wasn't just quoted by journalists. You find it in a lot of um, scientific textbooks. Yeah, the measurements from the uh, 
accelerometers I don't want to show in detail, but they correspond roughly with what we get from the muscle twitch method, but they are slightly lower, as you might expect, because we had to, uh, it factors in uh, the uh, drag underwater. So when these fish attack, I showed you already what happens when they engage with the fish, but interestingly, it's usually one sailfish at a time, so they almost queue up for this kind of thing. <clears throat> you see one doing it here, and the others are waiting. So there's a lot of turn-taking involved. And when they hit the fish, they usually injure quite a few, about here two on average, but only every fifth attack is successful. So this means over time, a lot of injured fish are building up in these groups. It's actually quite distressing to watch this because, I mean, you see hundreds of fish that are heavily injured and some are dying as you watch them. They get hit so many times. And, uh, and eventually they get picked off. But for the sailfish, this means while they are waiting, somebody else is injuring fish. And as they get more injured, they become easier to capture. We see this relationship here. Capture rate as a function of uh, injury level. So the waiting time isn't just a wasted time for these sailfish, but something uh, beneficial is actually happening for them. And this increases their efficiency a lot. So this is a, a model by uh, uh, Pavel Romanchuk, which indicates that the efficiency for the individuals is highest when they're in group sizes of about here 10 or 12 individuals and this can potentially provide benefits for groups of sailfish of up to 50, 60 or more individuals before they fall below the level of the efficiency of a single individual. And this is particularly important if they are under time pressure, <clears throat> then efficiency really matters. And what we found in the sailfish is that uh, when darkness comes or twilight, they abandon the hunt, they're very visual, and the fish often get stolen by other predators, and dolphins and other species come along and uh, take the sardines away. Also very annoying for us when that happens because uh, the moment you hear the dolphins coming, you know your study for that day is over. Um, they have a different technique. They actually hit with their tails into the fish schools, very much like killer whales, and uh, destroy the schools very quickly within seconds. Yeah, um, if, some, if, if there is this benefit of others injuring fish for you, then this, of course, begs the question, are there maybe sailfish around that wait during the initial hunting period for others to injure a lot of fish? And then when the, the, the sardines are quite weak, then they participate and start sort of harvesting sardines when it's easy. So it was basically asking the question, are some sailfish um, sitting back during the early attack stages? And Pavel's model indicated that there is a relatively small parameter space where we might expect this um, when the attack behavior is energetically quite costly. Then this could potentially um, be the case that some individuals sit back. Another prediction from this is that when, uh, if sailfish are monitoring different sardine schools that are under attack, and then they might focus on those that are already heavily injured. So we would expect that in the late attack stages, more sailfish um, come to those um, schools of sardines. Um, once we were able to identify the sailfish individually from their dorsal fins, um, we could look at some of these uh, aspects here in more detail, and we didn't actually see any sailfish um, that are sitting back and waiting. And we also did not see an increase in sailfish numbers towards the end of the attacks. But I have to admit, um, we haven't monitored that many attacks where we see it from fairly early on to the very end, um, because it's not that easy to keep up with the fish for the entire attack. 
Yeah, and this brings me to the topic of uh, laterality. So when we got the first images of these um, builds from the micro CT, we noticed that at the tip, some of them have these one-sided abrasions. And so we were beginning to wonder whether some of these fish are actually right-handed and left-handed when they hit. We started looking at the literature and laterality is uh, very widespread <clears throat> in the animal kingdom. We all know it from humans as well. They are right-handers and uh, left-handers. And uh, there's individual level laterality and population level. So humans, typical example of um, the latter, about 85 to 90 percent of humans are right-handed, the others are left-handed, and this apparently is the case um, in human populations throughout the world. And to my knowledge, it's not entirely clear why most of us are right-handed. There are a number of attempts to explain why this is. I've seen some <laughs> quite amusing ones, even in the uh, uh, sort of uh, disciplines from the humanities that uh, sort of people developed this because they were holding in combat the shield in the left hand to protect the heart and the sword in the right hand. But handedness actually goes <laughs> back a lot longer than uh, this type of combat. Nevertheless, combat is a very interesting uh, field to look at for handedness. Anybody who does martial arts will know that the proportion of left-handed individuals in martial arts is up to 40%. In fact, in almost all sports where it's one-on-one, -on -one, also in tennis and so on, because the rare phenotype is then at, a, at an advantage. So you see more left-handers um, in those kind of situations, which is an indication there are um, costs and benefits of these kind of things, even to this day in humans. Yeah, why specialize at all handedness? Why in the first place? It can really increase task efficiency. You can do it a lot faster. You can do it more accurate. You hesitate less. Um, but it can make you predictable. I mean, if you're fighting with someone, somebody boxing and you know this person is right-handed, you can you can anticipate certain things, it can be a huge advantage, and being predictable can then be a problem <clears throat> if you become predictable to your prey. So are the, the sailfish um, lateralized, and if so, are there adaptive benefits of this? Yeah, for this we uh, needed to uh, identify them. We used the shape of the dorsal fin, this is work with um, Ralf Curvis. And we looked at the expected degree of laterality here. So this is a lateralization index. So you take the attacks to the left side minus the right side divided by the total number of attacks. So this ranges from minus one to plus one. And then in the middle, um, you are not lateralized, those individuals. These are the expected distributions here, and we see the empirical one here. So there seem to be evidence for handedness because we get this bimodal distribution. <clears throat> Capture success clearly increases as laterality goes up, so more lateralized individuals seem to be more capable at capturing prey, and they are clearly much better with their preferred site than their unpreferred site. I think it's pretty familiar to most of us um, if you try to throw something with your, for me it would be the left hand. Um, well, I can't even open this bottle now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you will see there's a big difference. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at the difference in performance between preferred and unpreferred, then this increases um, as a function of how lateralized they are. So there's clear evidence that these fish are gaining something from being lateralized. <clears throat> but unlike in humans and some other organisms, left-handers and right-handers were about equally 
frequent in this population, okay? And this creates an interesting opportunity for the evolution of group living. On the y-axis, we have here the group lateralization index. So we look for a given group at how many attacks are done to the left and to the right. So in a way, this indicates how predictable a group is in its attack behavior. The higher this value, the more predictable it is. And we can see that predictability goes down as group size goes up. So if left and right handers are in equal proportion in, a, in the population and the fish come together randomly in groups of different sizes, then for these groups, predictability of attacking behavior should go down. <clears throat> That's the prediction and you see the empirical values um, are the unfilled circles here and you can see that this fits um, the curve quite well. If the dots were predominantly below this curve, then this would be an indication that they actively disassort and that left-handers are preferably together with right-handers and vice versa, but we didn't find um, evidence for this, but it's a small sample size, admittedly. But, of course, a very simple way for these um, fish, for these sailfish, to get a benefit from being in a group because they can specialize at the individual level without becoming predictable to their prey. <clears throat> so, to summarize, I showed you one effect of group hunting, making these animals um, more efficient by means of this turn taking and injuring more fish than they actually take and allowing them to specialize without becoming predictable. And the latter also makes this interesting prediction that Predators more generally might be able to diversify more when they are in their hunting strategies when they are part of groups than when they are hunting alone because this should keep um, predictability down. And this would be interesting to test for some other species. And this brings me to the end of my talk. I just quickly want to highlight a few of those um, people or organizations I haven't mentioned yet because this uh, was certainly one of the bigger studies where I relied on a lot of uh, expertise from other people and other teams. So first of all, the people who kept us safe in the water, our Mexican uh, colleagues, then all the teams who did the, uh, the scanning and uh, the interpretation of what we had scanned, and Kevin Boswell from uh, Florida University was brave enough to swim into the open ocean with his sonar. Thank you very much.